Good morning. I need you to help me out this morning. Um, I have something for you to do, which really invigorates me. I need you to turn to the person to your right, the person to your left, and tell them, I love you, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. Good morning. I bring you greetings from Turning Point United Methodist Church, located in the capital city of Trenton, where I am blessed to be pastor. I am blessed to be the senior pastor at Turning Point. Don't tell anyone, we only have one pastor. But I am that senior pastor. I thank Pastor Joe for this opportunity to be the messenger this morning. We pastors take very seriously who stands before their congregations because from time to time, if you're not aware who's standing in this place, things may go a little right or left, but when you are invited to preach before someone else's congregation, it's a blessing and it's an affirmation that uh, there is confidence in where we are spiritually and who we believe in and what we believe. So. I thank Pastor Joe. You see, our pulpit exchange this morning is just a continuation of a real and intentional relationship between our churches. You see, uh, uh, Pastor Kathleen has just mentioned our food pantry. I'm told that uh, Medford has supported our food pantry for many, many, many years. About a year and a half ago, Pastor Kathleen was our morning speaker for a uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Day. And about a year and a half, two years ago, a group of members from Turning Point United Methodist Church traveled here to Medford to have a discussion about race relations in America and the race issue. And it was a very in-depth and meaningful conversation. And it's the type of thing that we hear talked about in terms of our conference about churches coming together, but I am blessed and proud to be part of something that's really happening in a real way, and not just talk. Additionally, I stand as part of two communities while I served in Trenton, New Jersey for 30 years. My wife, Ann, of, believe it or not, 39 years. She's a great woman. <laughs> For 30 years, we have lived in Mount Laurel, just behind prospectors, and our four, three adult children are graduates of Lenape. I knew that connection, but as soon as I walked in this morning, I met Scott, and I realized, oh my goodness, Scott and my son Arvell work together, and in point of fact, for the last four years, I have been playing golf with Scott's golf clubs. And now I know who to blame for those high scores. <laughs> and lastly, I'm happy to be here this morning for a somewhat very selfish, very selfish reason. And I've already asked for forgiveness. A morning drive of 6.8 miles in 12 minutes is a, for at least one Sunday is a lot better than a 27 mile, 45 minute drive. Christ as community. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, a day we've never seen before. We thank you, dear Lord, for all that has transpired in your name. And right now, Lord, as we do each Sunday, we ask that you send down the preacher from on high so that your people will hear what you want them to hear and that your people will see what you want them to see and not this your humble servant. And Lord, we will give you all the glory, give you all the honor, and give you all the praise and give you all the thanksgiving, for we know you are here with us. For all these things we say on this morning, amen. People who identify as Christians and follow Christ have a tendency 
to compartmentalize our Christian faith and our Christian life. Too often we come to a worship experience each week. We go through the rituals, we smile, we say nice things to our fellow church goers, goers and then go back to our respective homes and back into the world, having placed our Christian persona on the shelf until the next scheduled worship experience. Sometimes we go out not only into our non-church communities, but sometimes we interact with those that we are in worship with in an insular, self-protected, very closed-minded and closed-hearted way, keeping it close to the vest. We say to ourselves, and many times when we do engage, we do so in the limited context of our own desires, of our own intellect, and our own safety. And if we bring Christ into the conversation, it's merely as icing on the cake and not the entire cake. Sometimes we treat Christ as an add-on to what we want to do, how we want to interact, who we want to love, and what we want to do. So this morning, I want to explore what it means not just to have Christ in community, but more intrusively to have Christ as community. In the reading of the scripture this morning, we see that the church of the second chapter of Acts was a community, all for one and one for all. They worshiped together, they loved together, they ate together, they cared for one another. If one hurt, the other hurt. They spread the good news, the good news of the gospel together, primarily by action and less by words. So much so that in this community with Christ as the center, day by day, there were people added to their number. Not so much by what was said, but what was done, having been Christ-centered in love and concern, even for those people outside of their immediate worship situation. You see, Christ was and continued to be the center, so much so that Christ was not merely in the community, but Christ, his love, the unity found in the koinonia, which means community, the sacrificial, selfless lives that they demonstrated, we get a picture of what Christ as community looks like. In his dissertation, Sanctorum Communion, and his guidebook, In Life Together, German pastor and theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer expressed the core of his Christian belief system of Christ existing within community. Bonhoeffer suggested that there can be no true community without Christ intrinsically at the forefront. You see, Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a very intelligent and very thoughtful theologian, but he was also a pastor. And Bonhoeffer left the ivory tower and he went into the streets. He left Germany and he went to Harlem, New York. And Bonhoeffer taught Sunday school at Abyssinian Baptist Church, a predominantly African-American church. And it was said that Bonhoeffer saw Christ as community in his experience in Harlem. But Bonhoeffer didn't stop there. He didn't have to, but he went back because he knew that the community needed Christ. And as a Christian pastor and theologian, he went back to Germany. And Bonhoeffer led a movement against Adolf Hitler as Hitler was being divisive as Hitler was being very much anti-Christ, as Hitler was showing the opposite of Christ-like love. 
Bonhoeffer just didn't stand there and talk about it. He put his Christ-like love into action, so much so that he finally was executed. But, but he did it for the sake of Christ, not for the sake of Bonhoeffer himself, but for the sake of Christ. Christ as community. I want to share with you four points this morning. Christ draws us into community. Christ guides us while in community. Christ protects us in community. And Christ is glorified in community. Christ draws us into community. We do good things. We collect food for those people in Trenton. We go to Roanoke on a mission trip. And there is a tendency to say, I'm doing a good thing. That's true, but it's the Christ inside of us that is drawing us to do these things. It's the Christ inside of us that's drawing us to do things like collecting freeze pops. It's the Christ inside of us that's reaching out to those who may not be in this, between these four walls, but it's Christ that draws us into community. And while in community, it's Christ that guides us. There are times when our human intellect and our human reason will say, this is what we should do, this is how we should do it. But as we lean and depend on the direction of Christ while we're in community, if we read and wait for that, Christ will guide us while we're in community. Christ protects us in community, not just physical protection, which is important, but also that psychological and emotional protection. Because sometimes when we're in communities, spreading the gospel through action, we're only human. Our feelings get hurt. At Turning Point, from time to time, each week, not only with our food pantry, but we're collaborating with some agencies. And every week, upwards of 200 people pass through the doors at Turning Point United Methodist Church. People who are not in worship with us yet, but they come from different places with different challenges. And sometimes when you reach out your hand in love, they may do something as a ghastly as slapping it or cursing you. Why are you trying to help me? Christ protects us while we're in community because relying on our own human intellect, our response is different if we don't respond in Christ's love. And lastly, Christ is glorified in community. We do good things. We go on mission trips. We collect food. We interact with the community. But through it all, it's not us. It's the love of Christ in us that is getting the glory. It is the love of Christ in us that is magnified. There is a speaker on YouTube, and his name is uh, Michael Jr. And he had a little clip about the what and the why. The what and the why. And he suggests that the what is the easy part because we can collect food for the hungry, we can provide shelter for the homeless, we can provide services for the, the less fortunate, which is all good. But why do we do it? We have a choice. We can do it because it makes us feel good. We can do it because we can stand up and say, oh, we, we fed 100 people this week. Oh, we want to feed 200 people next week. Aren't we great? We collected so many freeze pops. Let's collect, you know, 10,000 next year. Aren't we great? We went on a mission trip to Roanoke. And this next year, we're going to go to Oakland. Aren't we great? That is great in our human intellect. But if we flip that and make the why, we collected those freeze pops because that's an expression of the love of Christ. We collected food to send to Trenton, New Jersey, because that's a reflection of the love of Christ. We go on a mission trip to Roanoke. It's a great place. We did good work, but we did it. The why was because God allowed us and blessed us to be a vehicle and a vessel of his love. That's what Christ as community means. It means that things that we do, the good things that we do, they're really good things, 
but we step back and we say, not us, but it's the Christ living in us. It's the Christ living through us. That's Christ as community. In closing, let us consider Christ as community. As I prayerfully rewrite a portion of the love chapter of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, I would like to leave you with this. If we speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have Christ, we are a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if we have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if we have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have Christ, we are nothing. If we give away all our possessions, and if we hand over our bodies that we may boast, but do not have Christ, we gain nothing. Christ is patient. Christ is kind. Christ is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Christ does not insist on his own way to the detriment of others. Christ is not irritable or resentful. Christ bears all things. Christ believes all things. Christ hopes all things and endures all things. Christ is love. Christ, not in community, but Christ as community. Amen.